<laughs> Great. Welcome to the Western States Virtual Book and Paper Fair, which is being held online April 29th, April 30th, and May 1st. The book fair will begin at 9 a.m. That's Pacific Daylight Time for those of you in other time zones. We're so fortunate today to have a couple of experts with us to talk about shopping a virtual book fair and also just book collecting. Oftentimes at book fairs, we have a session called Book Collecting 101. So we're gonna to touch on a few of those topics, but we're really gonna focus on shopping a virtual book fair for any of you who are new to this experience. With us today is Laurel Swan. She's from Swan's Fine Books in Walnut Creek. Thanks for joining us, Laurel. Thank you for having me. Yeah. Uh, Vic Zoshak from Tavistock Books in Alameda. Thank you. Pleasure and to be of here. Course, great. And of course, Brad Johnson from Johnson Rare Books and Archives in Covina. Great. So um, let's just talk a few minutes just about collecting in general. Brad, do you have some <clears throat> points for people who are just beginning to collect? Um, sure. Uh, I, I think uh, the most frequent the given piece of advice is to just collect what you love, what you're passionate about. Um, and don't, uh, don't look at it uh, like you're trading stocks or investing in uh, a commodity. You know, these are, this is something that, uh, you know, is, is will appreciate uh, you, your appreciation from material will far exceed any uh, monetary appreciation during the process. Um, I also, highly encourage uh, collectors to establish relationships with reputable booksellers. They're going to be your eyes and ears. And these relationships are, are part of what makes the whole experience of collecting, you know, so worthwhile. Um, Vic, I'm sure you have a few things to add. Well, sure. Um, one thing I would recommend, is, unless your name is Gates or Bezos, uh, establish a budget. Um, you don't want this hobby or passion of yours impacting negatively on, you know, the rest of your life. Uh, be a joy, but don't let it become a burden financially. Um, within that context, buy the best copy you can afford. Um, if that means saving up a couple months, say you have a budget of $500 a month to spend on your collection, and the one copy you want is $1,500, save up for three months. Another uh, thing you can do is cost average. Let's say you decide the most I'm ever going to spend on a book, let's say that $500 again. But, uh, you know, if you spend $750 on one, another one at $250, that averages out to $500. So there you go. You, get, you fall within your budget, but yet you're able to uh, add those things to your collection that maybe go just a bit beyond what you thought you could do. Uh, let's see, what else? In, in the context of what... Uh, Brad was saying about establishing relationships, uh, booksellers can be your best friend. If you do not have the expertise yet about the subject area you're in, perhaps a bookseller does. Um, and so once you establish those relationships with somebody you trust, you can be the first to hear about X, Y, and Z before it even goes on the market. So it, that's a... Um, a really good tactic that Brad has put out there. Laurel, how about you? Do you have anything you want to add to this? Um, you know, you, you and Brad have brought up excellent points. I think the only one I might add in that dovetails with um, getting to know your local bookseller is learn as much as you can in other ways as well. There are often book clubs in different areas, and I don't mean a book club to read the latest bestseller, but a club of book collectors. Here in the San Francisco Bay Area, we're very fortunate. We have multiple clubs, such as the Book Club of California, the Colophon Club, and a few others. Um, those can be wonderful venues to learn from other collectors, mm -hmm. as well as to learn from um, experts from the programs they put on. And if you really want to get into the weeds, there's always bibliographies on many authors or general topics, which will be an invaluable guide in pointing you to uh, the writings of a certain author, how to distinguish the first editions, things of that nature. May, may I interrupt here? I, I'm yeah. a bookseller now, but I used to be a collector of Charles Dickens. 
And this was my guide, the New Cambridge Bibliography mm -hmm. to Charles Dickens' works. Uh, and, and as you can see, it's well used. And <laughs> <laughs> I took it with me everywhere I went, uh, especially all the book fairs, because I was after the first edition of those works. It also provided a guide uh, for me. My collecting goal, begin with the end in mind, was to get everything in here. Now, wow. not possible, wow. but it provided a, 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 guy, a signpost for me to go through. The ones you see with a little dot by them were books I acquired for my collection. Wow. So th that's a point you might take into account as you go shopping book fairs, have a reference with you to that subject area or that author that um, uh, interests you and the one you're pursuing. And, and if, certainly and one of the ways that people can uh, meet a lot of booksellers that you guys are talking about is by going to book fairs. Mm -hmm. um, not so possible during these times of pandemic, but they are possible virtually. So we're going to spend a few minutes talking about shopping a virtual book fair and, you know, maybe what's so unique about it, what's the same about it, what translates until we can all be in person again, which may be later this fall. And I should point out that we are, uh, we are filming this um, in uh, it's March of 2021 what year are we even <laughs> so we're gonna spend a minute and actually call up i'm gonna have brad call up on the screen right now there is a book fair that's going on that's uh, a virtual book fair that's going on for the ephemera society and if you were to actually um, attend this virtual book fair this is the first one of the first screens you would see if you clicked on um the dealers that are in the show and you can see that it lists all of the exhibitors who are there. In fact, uh, we're one of the exhibitors. So I'm going to have Brad just scroll down um, to Johnson Rare Books and Archives and click on our listings quickly. And then what you see is all the items that we have in our booth. So you can uh, search booth by booth. Uh, Vic, have you had much experience actually shopping virtual book fairs? What are your impressions? But it, I, uh, I have, um, it, there's, they've sprung up. It seems like there's one every other week recently because of the, the lack of physical book fairs. And the tactics I've employed, since I'm a bookseller, I, I have a wide range of interest of things that, that might work for me in my inventory. So I, I tend to do keyword searches, which on this platform that we're looking at right now, works very well. The Gutman platform has a keyword search and I've found a number of things um, via that mechanism. Uh, collectors, I suspect, uh, would have a single focus and might be able to um, uh, narrow their search efforts, um, pick a keyword, you know, uh, baseball, there you go. And, oh, I, I missed some of that stuff. <laughs> okay. Um, yeah. So that's, that's, <laughs> that's one tactic I use is keyword searches. Laurel, what, and what uh, do you use to search these things? Yeah. I, I also start with the keywords, Vic, just as you do, but then I also um, have certain um, booksellers that I've worked with in the past and I have a sense as to what they carry. If it dovetails with my interests, so I'll then go to their booths and just see what they have to offer. Um, and depending on how much time one has, it's fun just to, it's fun to just walk down the aisles more or less and take a quick peek if you can at every booth that's there because you never know what you're gonna come across that you didn't think to do a keyword search on. So it, it, it can be a lot of fun. Anything can be anywhere as Larry McMurtry said. Right, right, right. <laughs> you have a strategy, so, Brad? Well, I first want to take a moment to uh, shake my head that this bookseller uh, missed an opportunity to make an obvious Padres joke. <laughs> <laughs> Total missed opportunity. <laughs> um, uh, you know, as much as possible, this is a total uh, do what I say, what not what I do, uh, have a plan. Um, you know, virtual fairs are a little bit different than the, the traditional in-person fairs in that there's not all opportunity for all that horse trading to go on during setup. You know, when the virtual doors open, it's everybody has the same opportunity, you know, uh, to strike while the iron is hot. Um, 
And so uh, you have, you'll, you'll be in, in the mix with uh, professional buyers, other booksellers, librarians, archivists, and, and collectors, serious and otherwise. Um, so have a plan, uh, either target those booksellers where you've had success uh, buying from in the past, or as Vic suggested, like jump right in with your keywords, that, that narrow focus, that area well, that you, you collect. Brad, may I add to that? Um, if there's some booksellers you know that carry material you like, put the word out ahead of time to them that, uh, hey, you got a list, you got an advanced list. And who knows, you might be able to get it. Um, many booksellers do, do issue lists of things they're going to exhibit. Laurel, I know you and I have talked a little bit about photo photography and photos when you're shopping virtual book fairs because it's very visually driven. Mm -hmm. You have some things you wanted to say about that? Yeah, you know, um, they say a picture's worth a thousand words. And they can be, but they're not always. Um, just as a little side story, I had a friend in the shop here yesterday who asked me for help taking pictures of some books he was going to be um, contributing to a virtual exhibit. And it took us two hours and about 20 or so odd photographs to come up with the three that he was really happy with. So my point is it is very, very difficult to take a good picture um, of what, whatever you're going to have at the fair. And by good, I mean something that fairly represents the item. I think as a, as a buyer, I certainly want what is special about that item, whether it's the binding or the illustrations or whatever. And hopefully the bookseller or ephemera seller will have taken those pictures. Um, but you also need to use those. You need to be a little bit careful um, because pictures can be photoshopped. Um, some dealers do, some don't for a variety of reasons, but they can be. So you want to look at any photograph, I think, with, with a bit of a grain of salt. Um, use it in conjunction with hopefully a very detailed written description so that you know exactly what you're looking at, exactly what you're buying. And um, I think the last word of advice I would give is don't make any assumptions, either positive or negative. Sometimes we see an item, oh, I love that book. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I, just like that. I love that book, Sam, I'm going to buy it. But have <laughs> looked at the whole thing. Don't assume because there's one really nice picture, there's nothing negative there. Um, on, the, on the opposite, um, just because the seller discloses, rightly so, a few flaws, don't assume it, it, it's a terrible condition book. Try and get a really good overall picture of what you're looking at. Great. Yeah. Yeah. But may I add to that that uh, it, check on the return policy? Uh, yes. Almost every professional bookseller yes. will have a, a satisfaction guaranteed, no questions asked return policy. Great. Absolutely. And so um, just a point in um, the book fair, the, this particular ephemera fair, and of course for the upcoming Western States Virtual Book and Paper Fair, when you go to uh, look at an item, and if I can ask Brad to just click into an item, any item, and if you scroll down to the bottom of the screen where the item is, you're gonna see who the dealer is and their contact information. So you can reach them usually by phone. You can also email them. You can go to their website to learn more. Also, sometimes they have cell phones and they might have their policies and other things written there as well. So you can contact them immediately to buy uh, by phone or email. I, I recommend on that by phone, email. So <laughs> yeah. right. right. Jeff, sorry. Yeah. Oh, yeah. absolutely. Yeah. 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 Particularly at the beginning of these virtual affairs when, yeah, uh, an email will probably put you in second or third in line. So pick up that phone. <laughs> right. If not fifth or sixth. Yeah. Yes. <laughs> well, that's a good point because I, I think that we'll see in this fair that there are some things that are marked actually on hold. So what are you guys' thoughts on items that are on hold? Like, does that mean forget about it? It's gone. What should you do? Uh, personally, uh, from the buyer perspective, if I'm interested, I'd make that interest known in case the, the one that has it reserved doesn't come through. 
as a seller in these kind of instances, if I'm asked to put something on reserve, I put a specific time limit on it. I will do it through noon today or through 11 o'clock Pacific time today because I don't want to lose the opportunity to sell it should the one that asked for it to be reserved not come through. Mm-hmm. So other things that um, sometimes people who are shopping at book fairs might be curious about, oftentimes we hear, what about the price? Is the price firm? Can I bargain? Should I, can I ask for a discount? What are your thoughts, guys? It's a, it's a tricky question. Um, I mean, of course, we're always willing to consider more reasonable offers. I, I do caution collectors, though, that, um, uh, you know, most of us booksellers, our best offerings never make it online or to a virtual fair because we have established customers and, and clients who, um, you know, are, are as passionate about this material as we are. And um, they, they, they recognize its rarity and they, they, they don't generally haggle. Um, and so they get first shot at these things. So um, I, I, I just urge people to be respectful and uh, to recognize that uh, it might not always be their be- in their best interest to get a small discount. <laughs> Any other thoughts? I, I, I have the same thoughts as Brad. I mean, um, I, I'm a bookseller, not a book collector. So I do want to sell the material um, Plus, the other thing I would uh, really emphasize is the respect aspect. Um, if you come in and your approach is such that it calls in to question my professionalism or things of that nature, uh, we're not going to do any business. <laughs> I don't care what. <laughs> what uh... <laughs> right. Yeah, no, I, I, I agree. And, and, and asking the question in a respectful manner, I think, is paramount, as with any business communication, wherever we, we happen to be. Um, I think a part of the decision whether to ask for a discount, and I think Brad or Vic touched on this, should be the rarity of an item. If it's something you've sought for years and you know you're likely to ever see, do you really want, do you really want to ask for a discount? Um, <laughs> seller has done the research and come up with the price they think is fair. Um, if it's a common item and you feel it's probably out there at, a, at many different price points, then sure, ask respectfully. And sometimes the seller can work with you and sometimes they're not able to. Yeah. Great. Good. Let's explore a description because I want to take a minute just to and just go to our page so that we're not being critical of anybody's descriptions, but ours. Um, and let's kind of like, just take a minute to kind of break down a little bit, a description, maybe the one about the vice president or something. Okay. Okay. So, uh, so what we're seeing here is actually a document and anybody else chime in if you want to, but if you're, if you're going to be looking at a description, you're going to be seeing some information about when it was published or printed, um, where it was printed and generally perhaps something putting it in context and then some um, usually at the end, sometimes in other parts of the description, a description of the physical condition. So here we see some photos, but um, you're getting the size, the chipping along the lower edge. I think that's pretty straightforward, but are there other terms that people might have who aren't in the know might have some problems with? This is a really good point you bring up, Jen, in that that there is a jargon employed in the trade. And those new to collecting would would be um, serve themselves well by reading something like the ABCs of book collecting. Uh, There's an ephemera encyclopedia that explains the terms. Um, Just to have those in your library and get to understand what the bookseller or the ephemerist is telling you by using that jargon. Will, will help you in your collecting efforts. Yeah. And I think Laurel touched on this earlier, but, uh, you know, don't be afraid to ask questions. I mean, a lot of this is sort Good of point. Uh, Byzantine and arcane and, um, yeah, we have our own nomenclature in the book trade, and, uh, but we're uh, perfectly uh, happy and willing to um, to nerd out with you about all these things. <laughs> um, uh, yeah. So by all means, pick up the phone, send us an email. What have you? 
But I think uh, what, you know, in most descriptions, in, in addition to what Jen is noting, um, yeah, it, most of us will take an item, uh, put it in its, its historical context, describe the medium and how it was printed, and provide measurements of its sizes, and then detail all those little things that, uh, uh, you know, are considered flaws, you know, the, the wear and tear that it uh, has suffered over the years. So in the absence of that sort of things, those sorts of things, condition notes, you should definitely ask questions because otherwise you are in effect buying blind. Um, and, um, you know, a picture is helpful, but, uh, you know, having a sort of descriptive rundown is, is, is far more useful. Definitely. I, I think one term that be, can be confusing to newer collectors and can even be confusing sometimes to, to fellow booksellers is first edition thus. What, 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 what does that mean? And because it may mean slightly different things to different people. I, if I see that, I, unless the seller goes on to say, the first edition with illustrations by Arthur Rackham, for example, um, I would definitely ask, just ask the seller what they meant by that. Okay, that's a good point. Great. Well, I think we've had, a, you know, uh, we've done a pretty thorough job of going through this book fair. Is there anything that you, any of you would like to add, you think we didn't really cover that might just be helpful for an introduction to shopping virtual book fairs? I would just say that, uh, you know, when you enter this, this the, the Getman platform, um, you do have a couple options uh, in addition to uh, searching for individual booksellers, as you can see here. Um, and Vic talked about how we can use keyword searches. There's also this category function off to the side where, um, you know, it's an effect like keywords, but um, these are some more standardized uh, groupings of material that you're likely to see in the fair. So it's kind of like a shortcut. Um, so you, those are the three main searching mediums or options available to you. But uh, yeah, it's uh, by all means, go down that rabbit hole. <laughs> and and I, one last thing I don't think we mentioned yet is um, at many of these virtual book fairs, booksellers can restock their shelves. So even if you spend several hours on day one looking at what's out there, it might be worthwhile coming back the second or third day um, and, and checking again. Great. Yeah. Okay. And in addition to that, um, many of these fairs uh, have a really great um, slate of programming, educational programming that accompanies the fair, oftentimes not on the first day when a lot of the, the commerce is taking place, but on the second and third day. And there are virtual tours and uh, panel discussions, and it's a great way to have a, a sort of crash course on, on a given subject by experts in the field. Well, so we uh, would like to invite you all to come to the Western States Virtual Book and Paper Fair. That's April 29th, April 30th, and May 1st. You can learn more about the Western States Virtual uh, Book and Paper Fair by going to westernstates.getmansvirtual.com, or you can also visit rarebooksla.com. I would also encourage you to search um, and, and visit the website of the Antiquarian Booksellers Association of America, um, which is our professional trade association. We all belong to it. We're very proud of it. And we have a number of uh, book fairs as well. And you can learn more information about that there and about collecting and um, other things. So great. thank you all for joining us. Thank you. Thank you. See you at the fair. See you at the fair. <laughs> Bye. You can stop.